Good morning. Well, uh, I'm going to get to the lazy boy that's sitting up here. Uh, it's kind of like the pink elephant in the room. We'll get to that later. But first of all, I just want to welcome you all. I'm glad uh, we're able to get together this morning and worship and just come together and celebrate uh, the purpose of Christmas and just really kind of focus on that this morning. That's what we talked about last week is how do we fully focus and worship what God has done for us and how do we get away from what the culture has kind of told us and taught us and we've kind of uh, helped out with, in all honesty, of uh, this mad frenzy uh, of buying and getting and uh, making not maybe not Jesus disappear, but Jesus just part of the Christmas story, right? And so how do we make him fully uh, the purpose of our story and how do we make sure that he is priority over our Christmas time? And how can we celebrate that? How can others who don't believe recognize that, right? And so that's what we've kind of been talking about, and we want to continue that today. But um, before I get started, if you're a guest or you haven't filled one of these out before, we'd love for you to just kind of fill out and give us some information so that we can stay in touch with you and and uh, and uh, also just kind of make contact with you. So if you have interest in, in connecting and serving or being a part of a small group, you can also check that off. And um, we'd love to get with you and connect with that. So they should be in your seat or nearby. They're also up here at our, our tables, okay? So as we start, uh, today I just wanted to start off with this. I was talking to a friend about a Christmas uh, experience, and we were kind of talking about what we got as little kids. And we, we were at school, so we were, the kids were talking about what they got, and we were comparing to what uh, we got when we were kids. And uh, he, sa- he said, I had this worst Christmas ever. This one year, uh, I, there was only one thing I wanted, a G.I. Joe aircraft. He had all kinds of G.I. Joes, he said. He said he wanted the G.I. Joe aircraft. So that's the only thing he asked for, okay? And so his parents, he said his mom got him several other things, but he was so excited when he opened the package that had the G.I. Joe. He's like, I knew it. I knew if I just asked for that, I was going to get it. And so as we were talking about it, he's like, the, the worst part of it was I open it, and uh, he said, I think the elves were on strike that year because it wasn't put together, and I had to uh, assemble it myself as an eight-year-old. And so he was trying to assemble it. As he gets to putting the wings on, he notices that one wing is broken. So he came with a default Christmas present. The only thing he wanted, the only thing, the one thing that was going to make his Christmas perfect for him as an eight-year-old boy, okay? And it was broke. And so... Uh, he remembers his mom like trying to calm him down, and he was telling me about, uh, you know, how he was flipping out and was crying over this toy on Christmas morning. And uh, mom was like, "Well, I'm sure we can't take this back to the North Pole, but I'm sure Walmart has the same thing, believe it or not." And so, so we could probably take it and exchange it at Walmart. Walmart will probably let us take back Santa's gift and, and get a new one. So he was okay with that. Well, in the next couple of days. He's like begging mom to take him, so he goes a couple days after Christmas, and guess what? Walmart's all sold out. And so the one thing he wanted was broken, and then they go to exchange it. Walmart sold out, so he had to exchange it for something else, something else he didn't really want as much, right? And so I don't know about you, but... I can remember as a kid, there are different times where, like, I was disappointed because uh, me and my brothers always asked for a dog every Christmas. And every Christmas, Matt, did we ever get a dog? No, we never got a dog. So now we got dogs after we were adults, though, right? But uh, but we never got a dog. So there was always just that little bit slight of disappointment, right? Because it was about getting, right? As little kids, it was about getting something. And so at times there was that feeling of, this is the worst Christmas ever. So we, me and my friend were kind of sharing stories about some of those times where we just had those moments where the worst Christmas ever. But think about this, like, do, do Christmas gifts really mean that much, that we base our quality of our Christmas off of what we get, right? I mean, and we do it as adults. I'll be honest, I, I do it sometimes. Like, I can look back and think about, is my Christmas good? or not, based off of maybe I didn't really, maybe Kinder and I didn't really have the money this year to spend on what I really wanted, or this or that. And so I'm kind of bummed throughout Christmas, because I didn't get something. And if we're all honest with ourselves, we've had moments like that, where I think we make it about receiving, 
And uh, I, are, you know, I kind of want to ask this question: Are we really that shallow that at times that's what we're base our Christmas on? And uh, I, you know, I we're here this morning. We're celebrating, and and I would say most of us have put God in the picture of our Christmas story. But uh, how how much a part of that is it? Is he the reason we're celebrating and the reason we're we're coming to church and the reason why we're shopping and, and doing all these things? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not up here saying don't buy, okay? Like I said last week, I have family here. I have friends here. I'm expecting you all to give me some gifts, so you should buy. But have we gone overboard with that at times? Honestly, uh, you know, as much as I want... JC wants a PS4. Um, I'm not sure that's going to be the best Christmas present or make Christmas the best ever, right? If JC gets that that PS4 that she's been wanting so bad, right? That's not going to make the best Christmas. It makes it fun. It definitely makes it easier, right, to kind of focus on that when we get things we want. But that's not what makes the best Christmas. But yet, even though we know that, we, I mean, we can all sit here and say, we realize this, Kevin, we know this, you don't have to give me a guilt trip about it, that's not what I'm trying to do. We keep spending money, don't we? Kendra and I are doing it right now. We keep spending money on Christmas things in hopes that it's going to help improve our Christmas, right? Like, even in a good spirit, like, I want to give more to my friends and my family and, and my my coworker. I want to... I wanna, I want to give more to them, but it's more stuff. See where I'm going with this? Here's the cycle of stuff that we kind of live in. I, I thought this was funny as I started looking at this. When you're a teenager, you want your own stuff. Okay, and we're going to look at the different age levels here. But as a teenager, you're determined to get your own stuff, right? When you're in your 20s, you're on your own. You don't have a lot of stuff, so you want better stuff. And when you're in your 30s, um, this is where I'm at, you're sad because you thought you'd have more stuff. Your 40s, uh, you start getting the better stuff, but it's still not the best stuff. But here it comes, your 50s. You start getting all the really good stuff, but your adult children just take it all, all the time, right? So you really don't have it anymore. When you're in your 60s, you try to remember where you put that stuff or remember where your kids left it that borrowed it. When you're in your 70s, you start getting rid of all that stuff. And when you're in your 80s, you start taking people's stuff because it reminds you of something that you had or you just don't even know what you're doing in your 80s. So you already took it, right? No offense, guys. All right. Here's, here's where I've had a hard time over the past few weeks when I've dealt with this. America, Americans on average spend $450 billion on Christmas. I, I, I thought about putting some graphics up and, and showing you guys, but like it's hard to even comprehend what that is. It's like just a lot, right? $450 billion. 4% of that, about 4%, $20 billion dollars. Just 4% of the 450 we usually spend can give clean drinking water to the entire world. But yet, that, we haven't done that, have we? And so, what if we just all spent 4% less, right? Next Christmas and this Christmas. What kind of impact could we make? And now, you think, well, there's 70 of us here this morning. I don't know how much big of a difference can we make, but what about our surrounding, our circles that we impact, right? Here's a quick question for you. What was the one gift? I need somebody to participate with this, okay? What was the one gift you remember getting last Christmas? Somebody shout it out, a couple of you. Shout them out. A gift you remember getting last Christmas. Earrings. Way to go, Jason. Anybody else remember a gift? I'm sure you remember a gift. Some of you are like, I really don't remember, but that's okay. Socks? 
A lump of coal. What a good uncle. <laughs> okay, so what about the fourth best gift that you got? Or the fifth? Or the sixth? Does anybody remember which the fourth or fifth present that you got last Christmas? I don't. I, could, I mean, I've spent all week thinking about this, and I still couldn't come up with the fourth or fifth gift that I got. I, I may be using it, but I don't know. You can keep giving me gifts, though, okay, this Christmas. The truth is many of us don't remember it because this wasn't something necessarily we wanted or needed, right? We've kind of binged ourselves on Christmas getting, haven't we? So here's a disclaimer. This isn't a call, like I said, to stop giving gifts and to mope around this Christmas because Kevin's told you not to spend money this Christmas. That's not what it's about. But we've got that weird mentality where if a little's good, then a lot must be amazing, don't we? Like the binge type culture. If one donut's good, then a dozen's got to be amazing, right? Or if one gift makes them feel good, then I'm going to get them a bunch. And they're going to feel amazing about Christmas this year. This Christmas, my two daughters are going to be feel so amazed about what Christmas is about because I just got them an excessive amount of presents, right? Now, that sounds ridiculous, but that's kind of what we do. It's, I, I mean, I'm, I'm right here with you guys. So I'm not your mom or your accountant or your personal trainer, but many of you do call me Pastor or Rev Kev. And uh, this morning, I just want us to understand and help understand what the Bible really says about Christmas and worship. I want us to turn that Christmas upside down, so or right side up, like we said last week. I want our worship and our celebration and our focus to inspire others to seek God this Christmas, not to seek more stuff. Like, I want us in Hancock County and the surrounding area to be a catalyst for, for God to, to God's Word and God to be present and alive. And people say, they do Christmas different. They do everything different. What is it? How can they be so happy when they didn't give their kids 20 gifts, Right? I want us to be that example. So how do we get to that point? Like, where do we go? Is it just buy less this Christmas? I don't think, I mean, maybe we do. Maybe that's where we start, but I don't think that's all of it. How do we allow the focus for Christmas to shift so far away from Jesus? And that's what I want to look at this morning. So we're going to look at uh, Luke 2, and here's where my recliner comes in. I want us to get kind of comfortable here. When we read Luke 2, got my Christmas blanket, all right, we're ready to go. Somebody suggested I use a Snuggie for this, but uh, I'm not going to claim that I own a Snuggie. So. But as we read Luke 2, I want everybody to get as comfortable as I am, okay? Is this what it's about? You're all looking at me like I'm crazy. I just sat in the recliner, right? Christmas, you know, we live a life because we are so blessed in America. We live a life where we like our lazy boys. And we like to have a thermostat, right, and comfortable in our house. We've been blessed with that. But we kind of allow that, uh, we all do, myself included, allow that to kind of get in the way. And uh, we want everything to be comfortable, don't we? We want Baby Jesus' Christmas story to be comfortable, right? You know, and we want to celebrate something that's comfortable and, and easy and fits in with us. But it's kind of what we were talking about last week. Like, God doesn't just want the Christmas story to be a part. He doesn't just want to be a part of it. He is it. But we've oftentimes made him just a part, a little side part of our Christmas story and our Christmas celebration. So how do we do this? Because the Christmas story and what Jesus came to earth for and about living a life in a relationship with Jesus is not about sitting in a lazy boy comfortable, right? But oftentimes we want to spend our Christmas time that way. We want to spend our entire life in comfort. It's, it's easy for us to stay with what we're sure of. And so 
the Christmas story is not comfortable. It's actually kind of a dangerous story at dangerous times. Um, just a little background before we read this morning. Jesus was born in the day of Caesars, so they ruled over uh, the empire. And so Roman Empire was in control of most of the world at the time, the known world. And after years of bloodshed and brutal wars, about 27 B.C., a leader rises among the ashes, Octavius becomes a Caesar, and he becomes, uh, he changes his name to Augustus, which means deity, God. He changes his name, so it means God. So in that day, there was a state religion, and we're familiar with this, but uh, in America, we have that freedom, and, and it means uh, it went all the way back to mythologies and little gods, even though many people didn't believe it anymore at this time, when Jesus was around or coming into the world. It was a tradition, and you didn't mess with the tradition. So not everybody believed it, okay? And I'm sure we could come up with things that we don't really believe, but we still kind of go along with it. So on a family level, you could kind of do whatever you wanted during this time. There were so many different gods, and people worshipped all these little different gods for different reasons. But that was fine as long as you participated in the state religion, and you recognized the state religion. So Julius Caesar came before Caesar Augustus, and they declared these leaders deity. They were gods. Caesar Augustus was pretty good and pretty smart at this kind of stuff too. He was like, uh, think of like the best uh, public relations guy or the best advertiser, the promoter. Think about, you know, how, how crafty those people are about how they use their wording. And, you know, Apple has uh, been one of the greatest at, marketing that we got to have iPhones, right? And we got to have all Apple products, right? And so think about that, but think about it during this time. He was that crafty, convincing of people. So he didn't call himself a god because he knew that would kind of, you know, people would be turned off by that. But he wanted the people to look at Julius Caesar as a god. And so he set himself up that way for them to look at him as a god. Now Julius Caesar adopted a son was Caesar Augustus. And he was to be looked at as, if Julius Caesar was God, Augustus would be the son of God, right? And so now we're getting a little bit scary situation now that we have a little bit of story here. So they wanted to be recognized as God and son of God. They wanted people to worship them and understand their authority in that way. Matter of fact, this is what it said on their currency. they, They were fine with people saying this to them. Salvation is to be found in no other one than Augustus. There is no other name which can be saved. You can be saved. That was stamped on their currency. Their money said there is no other name by which people can be saved. So they were really trying to make sure that everybody understood where they were at on the food chain, right? So when Peter and Acts, after Jesus has died and he sent out people and believers started turning, and, and believing that Jesus was the Messiah who died for the sins, when that started being spread, and Peter and Acts says, there's no name given to him on heaven by which, uh, there is no other name given to him on heaven by which we are saved. It's in direct conflict with what our Caesars have said, right? And so that's not just uh, going along with it and kind of saying, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but let me tell you, I'm, I'll still pretend and, and play with the state religion, right? That's in direct conflict with that state religion. So we have this obviously danger in there. People were dying for this stuff. They weren't dying because they believed in Jesus and they believed Jesus was a Messiah, right? They were dying because they refused to follow the state religion. And they actually said, no, you're not any god. Jesus is the only way to get to God. Jesus is the real Son of God. So there was quite a bit of rebellious there, right? And that's why early Christians were killed, not because they didn't believe, because, uh, because they believed in Jesus, but because they didn't believe in Caesar. So let's, for real, now that we have a little backdrop on the type of Caesars and rulers we had during that time, look at Luke 2, 1 through 4, okay? Just real quick. It says, at that time, the Roman emperor 
Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken uh, when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. So David or Joseph and Mary had to travel back, right? Now, Bethlehem wasn't this large, magnificent place and beautiful urban uh, metropolis, okay? It was a small place inhabited by shepherds and farmers, just country folk, mostly living a small life, right? So if uh, the Robertson's family from Duck Dynasty were around, they'd fit in really well with this group, okay, this town. Um, They would really fit well. Mountain Man might even be there. Will probably be the innkeeper, right? Can you imagine him being the innkeeper that Mary and Joseph came to? Well, I don't have room for you in the house, but you can sleep in the barn, right? The barn, really? Well, the sheep and are really cuddly and will keep you keep you nice and warm. There's a manger too, right? Can you imagine him saying that? That's kind of what Bethlehem was like. Small town, just just average people living an average life. In Micah 5, verse 2, I want us to look at that this morning. Because it also reminds us what Bethlehem was like. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me. Um, Let's see. Out of you will come uh, come from you ones whose origin are from the distant past. A prophecy here saying you are going to have somebody special come out. In Matthew 2, it says this. Two... uh, Verses uh, 1 through 5, we'll start reading verse 1 here. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has the star um, who has been born and the star when it rose and have come to worship him? So Bethlehem. Important to note, right? We talked about Caesar's. Uh, Well, what about King Herod? He was a bad dude. Caesar Augustus couldn't rule over the entire place, so he had uh, rulers over different provinces. So King Herod was a ruler over one. So he was like a puppet. Wanted to please, had a big ego, wanted to kiss up to Caesar, Caesar Augustus, all right? So he was also very paranoid. Now, I don't know about this, but I, as I was reflecting, I'm like, a leader and somebody being paranoid, those don't really go well together, right? Because you can be leading a basketball team, you could be leading a class of kids, you could be leading something in a business world, and if you can't take criticism, right, you can't take people talking bad about you, then you're probably not going to be very successful, right? Because that just happens. So people disagree with you, and would, no matter if you're a management over something or you're, you oversee something, you lead anything, Right, even a Christmas play, you're going to have people judging and talking about that. So a king not liking people talk and being paranoid is is not a really good setup here. Okay, he wouldn't allow public gatherings because of that. He was so scared people would talk about him and try to go around him. He was so paranoid about his power that he wouldn't even let people get together in public. He had a lot of wives, uh, wives, but he only loved one of them. And uh, because of that same reason, he killed her and his two, uh, two sons and his mother-in-law. So to kind of show you, this is not a, a, a nice guy trying to do the right thing. He's worried about, number one, himself, right? Trying to make sure that he's, he's in line here. He's not going to stop at anything that's not going to support his power and agenda. He was consumed with his kingdom of more. He wanted more power, more control, more, more, more. Right? Kind of similar to our Christmas story. Right? Oftentimes we want more, more, more. Let's uh, keep reading here. It says, At the time, some of the wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star 
uh, as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this. Paranoid again, isn't he? As was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the lead, leading priest and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem and Judea, they said. So the prophecy is being fulfilled, right? And Herod should be excited. But the king of Jews has come. But he's not excited because why? He's known as the king of Jews. He's worried about how in the world can there be two kings? I'm the only king. I'm the only ruler. So he decided to wipe out every boy under the age of two to protect his throne. So when we think about uh, silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, right? We think about the little manger and uh, think about the little bitty farm animals coming around and the wise men on one knee, right, and the shepherds, you know. We think about all that and we think about the baby maybe Everybody being really quiet and the baby kind of, maybe baby Jesus making a noise. You know, that's, that's comfort for us, isn't it? We like to think of the story as being precious and, and sweet. But Jesus, his life's threatened right now. And anybody who associates with Jesus, baby Jesus, his, their lives are being threatened. So in the middle of this evil empire ruled by this dictator, King Herod, God enters the story, right? He enters the story in a manger. He doesn't kick down the door. He doesn't have this vast army ready to bulldoze the Roman Empire. No, he enters the scene nice and slow by telling shepherds and wise men, and they're in a manger, in a cave. So, The heart by heart begins to change people. And ultimately, the course of history, right? As Jesus pays that price for us so that we have an opportunity for eternity. He begins to turn things upside down from what was typically there, right? Turning it right side up. He begins a revolution, but not with force, but with grace. See, we like, that's that's the story. That's the salvation story, grace, right? That's the Christmas story. So what does this mean for us now that we've kind of looked at a little bit of what really was going on? What does that mean for us? Are there little gods in your life? Are there little Caesars trying to control things? Not pizza Caesars, okay? Are there things that you're trying to rule over that you refuse to kind of surrender? Those little gods say, if you'll bow down to me and worship me, You'll feel better if you buy more gifts. You get more gifts. You'll feel better. It'll be the best satisfaction and peace in your heart ever, right? Or if you get all your family together this Christmas for once, you'll feel better about Christmas. Or if that person that you have a broken relationship with stays away from you this Christmas, you'll have a better Christmas. What's it about? Because we are currently being bombarded, right? by all kinds of ads and text and, and emails. of um, if People still email outside of their jobs, I guess they do, right? Of all kinds of things that say, to have the best Christmas experience, you need this, or your kids need this, or somebody you know needs to have this. And so we've made the, the focus become on Black Friday and Small Business Saturday and Cyber Monday and what's uh, Tuesdays now, uh, giving Tuesday or whatever, you're supposed to give to a nonprofit or a school, right? It's our duty to spend more so that we can do our part to jump start the economy, right? They've told us that, right? Spending money during the holidays helps the economy out. I have just I have to have just one more thing, or I really need that gadget, right? Like Herod, we kind of live in that kingdom of more. We're, we're seeking more. And this is where we kind of uh, do the guilt trip, right? This is where I get to turn into Grinch and Scrooge all together. So I'm merging two, two uh, you know, sour people at Christmas time together to say, no gifts, no spending, stop it. At Revive, we have to do nothing, no fun. 
That's not what it's about, is it? But I think what it is about is having a conversation with your family or maybe by yourself and, and saying, Am I, are we spending too much? Has this gotten out of control for me and my family? Is this helping my kids or my family any by the way we currently do Christmas? Because stuff is not going to satisfy. We live in the kingdom of more. Christmas isn't about stuff. We've made Jesus just a part of the story, right? When we live in the kingdom of I've got to get more. So I'm not asking you to stop giving gifts or getting gifts. I'm not asking you to do something fanatical and, and stand outside of one of the shops and, and say no more spending or anything like that. But I think you should have a conversation with your family or maybe just a, a, a time to reflect with yourself. Evaluate your priorities this Christmas. Like, I know we've already done lots and lots of spending, and we've already done lots and lots of planning, but that can still change, right? I mean, in all honesty, if you're sitting here like, yeah, I have spent way too much, and I've already bought it all, my Christmas list is all checked off. I'm an overachiever. I finished before everybody else. Ha ha. What? You still have receipts, right? We still could go back, right? If you're sitting here thinking, I've overdone it, there's still a way for you to kind of move around that. So, Christmas was meant to be celebrated, not regretted, right? And in reality, not all of us look at Christmas as a, a time to celebrate. You know, we some of us have broken relationships or, or no longer existing relationships or, or just uh, lost loved ones where it's not easy to be in a celebratory mood. But at some point, we have to sit here and think and bow down to, to God, the Son of God, Jesus, and proclaim Him as Jesus as Lord. And we will worship Him and Him alone. Forget all this stuff that we push in to the kingdom of more. This isn't about saving money. This isn't about giving more money to the church. This isn't about anything else other than saving people. Like I said, can we turn Christmas upside down and not make it about buying? but make it about people coming to know Christ. This isn't about changing your mind about getting gifts or buying gifts. This is about changing the lives. So, as we, as we move forward, think about this. How comfortable have you been in just your Christmas story? How comfortable have you gotten just kind of going through the motions? Allow God this Christmas to get you out of that comfort zone. Allow him to speak to you. As God speaks to you, he gets you out of your comfort zone. He's going to call you to do something that you normally wouldn't just get up and do. And, and that's what the Christmas story is about, taking those risks and pointing people to Christ. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you so much that uh, you've given us so much comfort in life. And... Uh, You've given us this peace in our hearts. But, uh, God, so, so many times we look to everything else except you to give us that peace. We look for, for fame or popularity or, or a smile on somebody's face to give us peace when we know that you can only give us that peace, God. God, this Christmas, as, as we often do and so easily can, make it about anything but you. God, I just pray that these next couple of weeks can, we can focus on what you really did. And uh, not only in our hearts, but help spread that to other people's hearts, God. So, God, speak to us this morning. Speak to us this week and, and, uh, and teach us, God. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. As you uh, reflect and we sing our last song, I just want you to know that you have an opportunity to make it about something other than getting. About something that's going to last. And we talked last week some, and we have it over here. We have opportunities for you to, to, to give to something meaningful. And uh, I just want you to reflect on what that looks like for you. Okay? Let's stand. Let's sing.